Please open your Bibles to John chapter 12, verse 32. It's right in there, right in the middle, a long passage where Jesus is foretelling His death. He's talking about His death to come. And He says something very particular about it, about the power of it, about the, the effect that it will have on people. Not just that it's going to happen, but the effect that it'll have on people. And He says, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. And so from this passage, this evening, I'd like to talk to you about the cross of Jesus Christ. I want to review with you the power of Jesus' cross to draw all men to Himself and to keep them there. Because when it comes to Christianity, we need to understand that it isn't the church and it isn't our good lives, it isn't even the Bible that draws people to Jesus. These things, they, they point the way, but in themselves, they do not have drawing power. What draws people to Christ is His cross. The church proclaims the cross, our good lives confirm the cross, the Bible records the cross, but in the end people come to God because of the cross of Jesus Christ. It has the magnetic force within Christianity that has the power to draw, to pull people towards God. And so in my lesson tonight I'll try to explain what it is about the cross that attracts people to Christ. Well, first of all, the cross has the power to set men free. It represents freedom. Whether they admit it or not, people carry in their hearts an incredible load of anxiety and fear because of guilt. This is normal because all men are guilty of sin, and this fact has been well documented in the Bible. The universality of sin is a core Bible doctrine in Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 9, if you have your Bibles again. Go there, Romans chapter 3, verse 9 says the following, What then, Paul says, are we better than they? Not at all, for we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin, as it is written, there is none righteous, not even one, there is none who understands, there is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become useless. There is none who does good, there is not even one. And then a little further down in verse 23, he summarizes this idea when he says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What's the, what's the summation? What does he say about all people? He says all are guilty of sin. Both Jews and Greeks, all are guilty. Well, this problem has moved people to seek relief from the mental and emotional and physical ravages caused by the guilt created by sin. We've had all kinds of ways to deal with this guilt, this, this weight on our hearts. Social reform, new philosophies, escape through drugs or magic, even denial, you know, I have no sin, there's no such thing as sin. All of these things, and yet all to no avail. Because none of these so-called solutions can do what the cross does. And the cross removes the cause of guilt, which is sin. These other things deal with the symptoms, but the cross effectively eliminates the root cause of sin. In 1 Peter, Peter says, and He Himself bore our sins in His body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, for by His wounds you were healed. Just another way of saying the burden is lifted from us. What Peter is saying here is that Jesus heals us of the effects of sin by removing our actual sins from us and taking them on to Himself. Jesus doesn't excuse our sins, He doesn't justify them, He doesn't hide them, He removes them through a process of transference. 
a process that was previewed by the Old Testament sacrificial system for centuries. You know this, we've studied this in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, when a priest would offer up an animal as sacrifice for someone's sin, he would first lay hands upon the animal as a symbol that a transfer was about to take place. You can read about this in Leviticus, Leviticus chapter four and so on. The sins of the individual were being transferred to the animal and the animal was being slain in order to symbolize the payment of the moral price of death. Because God's eternal law said that the price of sin, the result of sin is death. That's the cost of sin and it needs to be paid. So with the sin symbolically transferred to the animal and the animal then sacrificially slain, some people say, well, why kill the animal? Well, the sacrifice was there because death was the way that something was transferred from the physical realm to the spiritual realm. If you wanted to transfer something from one realm to the other, destruction was the way, complete destruction. In this way, the person was cleansed from the burden of guilt caused by sin. Of course, we know today that this was a, a preview of what was to come. It didn't effectively remove the sin, it was a preview of what was to come. Jesus, the perfect and innocent lamb, taking on the sins of all men, not symbolically, but literally, and then offering up His sinless and eternal being in a sacrifice on the cross in order to make moral payment for all the sins, for all people, for all time. Now, I say an innocent and perfect life because the sacrifice had to be without sin in order to atone for sin. Not to have a perfect life would contaminate the sacrifice. The sacrifice had to be pure, no contamination whatsoever. And I say eternal or divine as a life because Jesus was the Son of God. And as such, the value of His life made His sacrifice adequate for all men. His divine nature makes His sacrifice good enough, valuable enough to exchange for not only one life, but for all lives. If I was, uh, if I was a, a, a man who had no sin, well, perhaps I could offer my life for another, one perfect life for another sinful life. But my perfect life, because I'm a human being, could only be exchanged for one other life. One life worthy of one life. But Jesus was divine, is divine. He was the Son of God. The innate value of His life was worth not just one life, but all the lives of all the people who ever lived. And so people are attracted to the cross because they see in it the place where they can transfer all of their sins and be released from their guilt. When people hear how Jesus died in order to pay the moral debt that they have before God, they are attracted. They are attracted because at last they have found the only way of dealing with their guilt that removes it forever, and that is through forgiveness from God. I tell people, you know, if God has forgiven you, you have a right to forgive yourself. So many people go around you know, carrying a burden of guilt for something they did in the past, you know, some foolish act, some you know, whatever, a sin. And they just have trouble feeling free of that. They have trouble feeling uh, 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 innocent, forgiven. And I tell them, if God has forgiven you, then you have the right to forgive yourself and moves on. But if God has not forgiven you, it doesn't matter if you forgive yourself. You're still accountable to Him. And so the most compelling words to a sinner in the New Testament are those of Peter and Paul. Peter said, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Oh, what good news that is. And Paul says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 1, Acts 2, 38. I've told you this before, but it's worth repeating, I think. Those are the words that'll be on my tombstone. 
on my tombstone, maybe my name, maybe when I was born and when I die, but the passage, it's in my will. It's in my will. The passage I want on my tombstone, Romans 8.1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In that way, I want to continue to preach to every person that will come and visit someone who has departed, someone who will visit me, my grandchildren and their children. Sins are transferred to the cross. Forgiveness comes from the cross. Guilty sinners are drawn by the cross of Christ. They're not drawn by buildings or programs or events. Secondly, the cross has the power to create in me a desire for righteousness. Why does the cross have power? What power does it have? It has the power to create in me a desire for righteousness. In other words, the cross has the power to create in a person the love and the desire for what is good, for what is right, for what is true, for what is pure. Even though a person cannot achieve perfection on this earth, the cross of Christ gives him a thirst for it. No law can produce this in a person's heart. No threat of punishment can make me want what is right. Now, threat of punishment can make me do what is right because I'm afraid of being punished, but no threat of punishment can make me want what is right, can make me love what is right. No amount of self-discipline or self-will or willpower can make a person love righteousness. However, the cross of Christ has attraction because it has the power to create this desire in the human heart. How does it do that? You know, when I contemplate Jesus' sacrifice for me, I see for the first time the essence of God's deepest goodness and purest justice. I see by the cross that I worship a God who took upon Himself a human nature and entered into human history in order to suffer the punishment for the sins that I committed and for which I truly deserved punishment. In other words, God's transferred my sins onto Himself. This knowledge awakens in me the desire to have and to do what He did. Let's go this time to Romans chapter seven, shall we? We're not far, we're in Romans three. Let's go over to Romans chapter seven, verses five and six. Listen to how Paul explains this idea. He says, for while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law. Look, aroused, right? Something stimulated. So he says, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death, but now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in the newness of the spirit, not in the oldness of the the letter, in the same way that I craved after evil. You know that desire that you have to do something wrong sometime, whatever it is. I'm not going to make a long list of sins, but you know what it is to desire, to lust after. It's a feeling, you want something. Well, in the same way that I craved after evil and the pleasures of sin, after the cross, I hunger and I thirst after righteousness. Now that I've seen what perfect righteousness does. If the law can stimulate in me a desire for evil, then the cross stimulates in me the opposite desire for righteousness and goodness. Because of the law, the sin in me was aroused. Because of the cross, the spirit in me is aroused. Moreover, the cross makes me want to abandon forever my weak attempts at goodness and self-justification through works and desire to be good and righteous as He is good and righteous, a goodness and righteousness that totally eclipses my own. You know, there are many things in the world that will change a person's appearance, even his state of mind, but only the cross of Christ has the power to change a person's heart. Before the cross, 
I desired only what served me. After seeing the cross, all I desire is what will serve God. And so the cross has the power to release. The cross has the power to create. And finally, for this lesson anyways, the cross has the power to convince me that I am loved. You know, one of the common issues found in diverse problems such as teen suicide and depression and alcohol and drug abuse and marriage breakdown is the problem of low self-esteem. Sometimes we don't like ourselves very much. Can you relate to that? We worry about our value as human beings and we have trouble liking others because we have a poor estimate of ourselves. You know, sometimes it begins in youth when in different ways we get messages that tell us that we're, we're not quite okay. Perhaps it's the names that other children call us for whatever reason. Perhaps it's a failure in school. Perhaps it's trouble between our parents. Whether these messages are accurate or not, this is not the problem. The problem is that we think they are and we begin to store them away in our subconscious mind. And then as we grow up, in many ways, these kinds of thoughts motivate us as we grow older. We try to improve in order to quiet that voice inside that says, you're not worthy, you're not really that good. Why are you trying so hard? You're never going to make it, what are you? You know, you ever do something and make a mistake or whatever it is, you're cutting, you know, you're cutting, making a dress or you guys are building something and you make a mistake, you, 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 you misjudge and you, you go ahead and saw that piece of wood and realize, oh, I, I sawed it two inches short, you know, and then what do you say to yourself? You dummy, what's the matter with you? You, you know, and you, you start talking to yourself and I say, I say to people, who is that person who's talking to you? Is that Jesus that just talked to you? That called you a stupid idiot because you happened to cut a piece of wood incorrectly? Who is that person? And if you were to analyze it, you'd find out that that person is maybe a composite of many, many people throughout your life who didn't think you were very good, who didn't think that you were, you were worthy. Children who grow up believing that they're not okay become angry and depressed and frightened and insecure as adults. And you know what they do? They end up raising the same kind of kids. But the cross of Christ has the power to finally break this cycle because it loudly and clearly says, I love you. It clearly says, you're okay with me. When nobody cares about you, even when you do not care about yourself, the cross of Jesus Christ says, I care, I still care. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life, John 3, 16. Does that not say, I love you? For while we were still helpless, at the right time, God died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, verses six to eight. Does that not say, I love you? Doesn't it say, I love you, even though you are ungodly, even though you are ugly, even though there are things about you that are not right? The cross convinces me. You see, it just doesn't tell me, it convinces me that I am loved because in it, I see that God loved me even when I ignored, even when I ridiculed, even when I hated Him, He was planning my salvation. The cross convinces me that I am loved because in it I see that the innocent died for the guilty. The cross convinces me that I am loved because in it I see that my friend gave his life up for me. 
as John writes in John 15, no longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. The Son of God has called us friends and has died for us. I'm pretty convinced that He loves me. And so the cross draws men because it has the power to convince them that no one has ever loved them in this way before and no one will ever love them this way ever, ever again. Even if our personal history is filled with people and events that have told us that we're not worthy of love, the cross of Christ stands as an eternal witness that no matter what, no matter what, I have to say it again because in 33 years of ministry I've heard so many people give reasons why they think God doesn't love them. And yet the word tells us no matter what. I love you, he says. So long as we keep our focus on the cross, we'll never doubt that we are okay with him. It has the power to continue to convince us every single day until the last day of our lives. You know, in Romans chapter one, verse 16, Paul says that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And this is true, of course. But the power of the gospel is the cross of Jesus Christ. Why? First of all, it draws me because of its power to release me from the crushing burden of guilt that I carry because of my sins. It draws me because it redirects the intention of my heart. Once I crave for my own glory and independence from God, now I desire to glorify Him and know His will for my life each and every day. And finally, it draws me because the cross has the power to reestablish my worth as a person. I tried to be important and loved by manipulating people, using money, competing with others, but now my importance is based on the fact that God has noticed me and sacrificed Himself for me. I can honestly say that the power that the cross has is the power to completely change my life. And I can tell you that is my witness. It's not just a sermon, it's my testimony. If you experience the power of the cross, really, to release you from guilt, to create a new heart in you, to convince you that you're loved, you can. Here's how it works. In order for the cross to begin to have any power at all, Jesus had to first die on it and then resurrect from it. This is what gives the cross its power the death, the burial, and the glorious resurrection of Jesus. Well, in the same way, for the cross to have power in our lives, we must also die and resurrect from it. Now, Jesus actually did this on a wooden cross some 2,000 years ago. Our death and our resurrection are carried out in the waters of baptism as we confess our faith in Jesus and we repent of our sins. Again, in Romans uh, chapter six, verses three and four, Paul explains this imagery, this idea, this phenomenon, when he says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into His death? Our death, His death, there's the death. Therefore, we have been buried with Him through baptism. There, that's, how do we die? He says, through baptism, into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead, there's His resurrection through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. There's our, there's our resurrection as well. Those who have not experienced a personal death and resurrection in the waters of baptism will never experience the regenerating power of the cross in their lives either. That's why there's so many people that are sitting and you know, they go online, they, they, they're, they're reading all kinds of blogs about religion and they go to this church and they do this and they do that, but there's no spiritual power in their lives. Why? 
uh, because they're just looking at the cross. They're just studying about it. They haven't died with it. They haven't resurrected with it. That's what gives the power. And the power is not a secret thing. You can see it as believers hang on to the cross with Jesus through repentance and baptism. As Christians carry the cross every day through patience and suffering and temptation. As disciples preach the foolishness of the cross to a skeptical and sinful world. As saints show their love for one another in sacrificial service, the cross is present, the cross is being put forward day by day by day by day by those who have died and resurrected from it. The power of the cross is made evident to the world in us, in you and in me. And so I pray that the power of the cross will draw you to obey the gospel this very day if you haven't done so. And I also pray that its power will be evident in your lives for the benefit of others. I pray that the power of the cross in your life will become the power of the cross in the lives of all those you meet. If you need to make a response to the invitation, and the invitation is to come to the cross of Christ, we encourage you to do so now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.